This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Howard Berman, who was a member of the U.S. Congress for 30 years, serving California's 28th Congressional District. He also served as chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Congressman Berman, welcome to Berkeley. Nice to be here. Where were you born and raised? Born in Los Angeles, raised in Los Angeles. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Um, my father was an immigrant and uh, uh, came from Poland. Uh, and, uh, and the family background, uh, Jewish, uh, uh, it's had a major impact on one my feelings about Israel and uh, and secondly about uh, about the notion of uh, America ignoring what's going on around the rest of the world and the bad things that could happen from that so uh, uh, I'd say in that sense they weren't political but uh, but they had views on these subjects and was there discussion of political events current events around the dinner table uh, not so much at, at a young age by the when I got more interested in politics, it became a, a much greater discussion around the dinner table. And uh, as uh, in your primary school education, high school, were there any teachers that, that influenced you in, in, in the direction of politics? Uh, one teacher in particular, a high school teacher in civics, she, was, uh, she essentially threw away the textbook and took the great issues that were going uh, occurring at the time, this would have been the very late 1950s, uh, uh, 58, 59, and made them sort of the subject of the course discussions. She uh, brought to our attention magazines uh, from the left and from the right uh, that had different views. Uh, it, uh, I, I was enthralled by it. Uh, it certainly uh, set off my interest in public policy, international relations, these issues. Uh, then you did your undergraduate work where? UCLA. UCLA. And what did you major in at UCLA? International relations. And who did you study uh, international relations with? At, well, uh, you... we had a number of professors. At that point, I was actually entertaining the idea of, uh, of a career in the Foreign Service. And, of course, height of the Cold War, the Soviet Union. Uh, so I chose Russia as my language mm. to learn and took a lot of, uh, of courses in Soviet foreign policy and Russian history. And, but, but uh, you know, it, it was, uh, uh, I had a number of different professors uh, there and it wasn't like one took hold of me and mm -hmm. uh, it's a big school. <laughs> and at UCLA, did you did you uh, uh, engage in student politics? Not not student politics as such, but the Young Democrats and uh, political campaigns and the civil rights movement was unfolding at that time in the early '60s, and uh, uh, these were so there were issues in society that I was involved on the campus in. And is UCLA undergraduate when you met uh, Congressman Waxman, uh, who was a fellow student then? That's right. We were both in the Young Democratic Club at UCLA then. And uh, is that uh, presumably you worked together and really got to know each other? Uh, we became uh, close friends uh, and with a small group of people. We met through the Young Democrats and, and who were 
in some cases outside of UCLA campus as well, it became the nucleus of a friendship that I think played a enormous role in both of us having a successful uh, entry into elected office. Uh, then t on to law school. Where did you do your law UCLA. school? UCLA. UCLA. It's very interesting. I had to decide whether to go to UCLA or what we called it then, Bolt Law School. Mm -hmm. And I was involved in a political campaign, and uh, I knew that if I went to Bolt, I'd have to get out of that campaign. And uh, this is in the spring, so I say, I'm going to go to UCLA, stay with UCLA for law school. And then, of course, my candidate lost in the primary, and there was no general election, but the die had been cast. So, <laughs> so you were actually uh, had a, uh, you were majoring in real politics as you were getting your law degree and your undergraduate degree. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we were involved in in the in the political process through the Young Democrats and other activities uh, going from the demonstrations associated with the civil rights movement to the precinct walking associated with campaigns. So so your relationship with this cohort and, and with Waxman was that did that sort of evolve over time? It was it was really kind of a natural undertaking having built these ties uh, while you were in school. That's right. No, this is, uh, the group we met through this activity became the core of first his race, running against a Democratic incumbent uh, in 1968. And, and that for the state legislature? For the yeah, state, state assembly. And yeah. then four years later when I ran for the state assembly against an incumbent Republican. Uh, and and uh, this, so it, you learn together uh, by doing, really, were you planning for the future, or, or, or did that only no, come? No, I, I certainly wasn't. Uh, actually, the the thing that got me interested in a legislative career um, was when I finished law school. There was a an assembly fellowship program in Sacramento, and I applied for that. Uh, was accepted to it, and they chose ten of us, usually people in gra finished graduate school or law school. And uh, it was my year in Sacramento working there that whetted my appetite for, it was, it was my, it was seeing that if you are satisfied with making incremental change, uh, you don't expect nirvana and paradise from what you're doing. But if you can see a process that makes some people's lives better that you care about, uh, that was a worthwhile activity. Did, did your education, either as an undergraduate or a law student, uh, help you understand better this notion of an incremental process, or did you learn that when you were actually uh, an intern at the legislature? Well, I think anybody involved in politics very quickly accepts it's either incremental progress or you get out of politics because uh, um, we, we'd like to think of things that are so dramatic, uh, and there are some historic things that happen that make major change, but uh, it probably developed through my political activity, but I became acutely aware of that watching the legislature in action and seeing some talented legislators able to do things, overcome opposition, and get something through that made people's lives better. I like to ask my uh, guests, whatever their field is, what they see as the skills uh, involved in what they do and the temperament. If students are watching this program, uh, what uh, should they know about the skills uh, involved in being a successful legislator? It's a little tough to do that kind of uh, self-analysis, but by and large, I guess I simplify it to one try to know the subject as well or better than anybody you are going to to get support for your proposal. Uh, secondly, um, uh, don't go in with that sense of moral righteousness that puts them on the defensive. Uh, uh, and third, and here I, I say this quite seriously, some of the best things I've done do quietly. Don't try to become the uh, center of attention uh, and turn it into a, 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 a personal kind of a thing, because that will be off-putting to people. And if, if you're willing to work quietly, one, you don't rile the opposition as much, and second, you can get a lot more done. 
And in terms of temperament, you, you seem to be saying that patience really counts. Yeah, and, and when you don't get it the first time, you go back and you go back and you go back. And uh, um, the, probably the most disappointing thing about not being in Congress now, uh, having uh, lost my last election, uh, is that immigration reform is something I've been passionate about, very involved in all the measures through my entire 30 years. And we still aren't at the day where we've passed the comprehensive immigration reform legislation that I personally think is so much in the country's interest. Uh, what about leadership? Uh, are there, have you uh, f want to share with us, let, let me put it this way, do you want to share with us some of your thoughts uh, of what, it, what are the traits of a leader as a, uh, that is a leader who is a legislator, uh, building coalitions, uh, winning over the other side and so on? What, 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 what is the skill base there? Well, I think it, it may be less, it may be a different kind of leadership than the leadership in, in the executive branch of government or on the campaign trail, but it's, uh, you said it earlier, patience, strategy, uh, f coming to a strategy and then working really quite uh, focused on achieve, implementing that strategy to get the block of votes, to get the support, to figure out what could make X, who may not be of your party, uh, who may, you may not have that kind of personal relationship. What are the forces that could bring X to support your, your measure? Um, coalition building is a good way of putting it. Um, uh, you and Waxman uh, were uh, very successful at building alliances, I think you call it, between like-minded people, or that's a term that, that I think he uses. Uh, some have even called it the Berman Waxman machine. So let's talk a little about getting elected. You both, as a team, were very innovative in developing strategies to be successful in elections. Uh, talk about that learning process. Well, in all fairness, um, we were blessed, uh, in my case, with a brother, uh, in Henry's case, with a friend who became a professor at UCLA in sort of understanding how you talk to voters and, and developing a campaign that delivers those messages effectively so that uh, um, we had our strengths, but, but the campaign techniques that we utilized, which involved in many cases using computers very early in the day uh, uh, to, to, to get out mail and to send messages uh, was because we were part of that core group we assembled when we got into the volunteer politics of the UCLA and broader uh, community uh, uh, included people with those kinds of skills. And, and so you, you were an innovator in essentially micro-targeting. Uh, appealing to different groups in your constituency with a message that related to what they wanted. Look, there's one thing I think is pretty clear, but not everybody actually strategizes and develops a campaign based on it, which is what goes into how people vote. Ethnicity can be very important. Religion can be very important age can be important, occupational background can be important. And the fact is, the irony is that the more data you gather about your, your electorate in specific, individual by individual, allows you to talk in a way that makes yourself more appealing to that voter. And what is also involved is uh, ultimately when you're successful and at raising money, for example, is, is putting uh, pots of money together to help elect uh, 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 people who will vote with you in, in the Congress or the legislature. Yeah. Well, let me go back to your earlier comment about the quote machine. Yeah. We didn't have a machine. Uh, a machine in the, 
in the old Tammany Hall, Chicago, sense yeah. of the word was jobs, patronage, building up neighborhood organizations through uh, taking care of people. We had a, a group of committed people. What we were willing to do that many other politicians weren't was to marshal our efforts to help a third person win a political contest. Uh, it's not just about me, what office do I run for next, how high can I go? It's about creating a larger network of friends and alliances, which makes you then more effective in the legislative body you're working in. So it, you could almost call it anticipatory coalition building. Yeah, that's, that's true, that's true. And, and you, I, I know that you came from West Hollywood, right, or West L.A.? Uh, I, I grew up in uh, Western Los Angeles. But, but I mean, your area. district uh, was uh, able to, to provide you with campaign funds uh, uh, that you could use in, in creating these Look, future alliances? L L.A. is a huge metropolitan area. My district was actually, during most of my time in mm. office, almost entirely in the San Fernando Valley. Mm. Um, I obviously had a strong base of support there. But the fact that people lived in, if they cared about the work the I issue. was doing and the issue I was interested mm. in, they were less concerned whether they happened to live in my congressional district or not. So my fundraising base became much broader than my geographic territory. So, so what interesting, what, what I'm learning here is that you're saying that it was about the message and the, the, the statistical and other measures of what people wanted were helping you form a message which then appealed to a broader uh, group of people who might f support you because of the importance of the message. And then if compatriots got elected, they would be there to, to uh, as a coalition to achieve what you had promised in the election. Yeah, and, um, but, and also to achieve a philosophical agenda that we had. Yeah. Uh, or uh, help to achieve something I could do for my district because uh, you have friends who aren't from your area and willing to support something because of your relationship with them that's for your district. Uh, you're enhancing the power of your constituency because you're able to do more for them. In, in reading about you, I gather you were perceived in the Congress as even-handed. You were fair, and you had mentioned that, that some of this is negotiating behind the scenes and so on. Talk a little about that because that clearly must be a skill that was involved. I mean, uh, uh, somebody from the other party could deal with well, Howard Berman because he was seen as fair. I'll, I'll, I'll use one example. Um, Lamar Smith was chairman of the Judiciary Committee and before that the Intellectual Property Committee, a c pretty conservative Republican from the Texas. He and I had very deep differences on the immigration issue. But on intellectual property issues, we and on a number of other issues, we could work together quite well. Um, uh, we both served as chair and the ranking member of the Ethics Committee. And we were able to keep our differences on immigration, which were quite passionate, up out of our work on the Ethics Committee or in, in pushing uh, intellectual property protection uh, issues in, in, in our intellectual property subcommittee. Um, uh, he kept it from being personal. And you focused on the issue. Okay. And is, th is this one of the characteristics that we're seeing now that does not exist? Namely, it's, it's, a, it's, it's impossible or very difficult or more difficult to build bipartisanship on issues because if the Democrats proposed it, then some Republicans are going to oppose it? I'm of two schools on this. Uh, part of me thinks for everybody at any given time, seems, things always seem better in the olden days. <laughs> All I know is why couldn't public education be as good as when we went to school? Well, when we went to school, nobody was talking about how great public <laughs> education was. So, so yeah, there is this tendency to think it's never been this bad. Um, 
the other side of the coin is there has been a fundamental change. It's not just recently. It's been going on for 20 years. And part of it came in, in, the, in the, at least in the House of Representatives context, came that for a very long time, the Democrats and the Republicans assumed the Democrats would have a perpetual majority. And they became accustomed to it. And you found ways to work together. And they had enough action that they didn't... Newt Gingrich, more than any other single individual, challenged that assumption, said, you guys, what are you doing? You're living with this. We're going to have a revolution and take it on. And that created a level of partisanship that did the temperature was raised, and it's never quite calmed down since then. Um, now you add to it a president, uh, uh, a Democratic president, who uh, for all kinds of reasons, the Republicans perceive uh, on foreign policy, on domestic policy, by background, as sort of an anathema to things they care about. and. And that, that creates an additional level of hostility and anger and, and, uh, and deadlock. We're, we're in a situation now where it, it appears that uh, the Republicans at the state level are doing a lot of gerrymandering or building districts to ensure congressional minor, uh, majorities. In, in the future. Is this the same old tactics that have been around in politics with, with the Republicans now being kind of over the top in the way they do it? Um, if you're a Democrat and you watch Republicans doing it, it sure looks over the top. <laughs> but I take you back to 1981 when a congressman from the Bay Area, Phil Burton, was directly involved in the legislative redistricting of that year. And there were Republicans who went berserk over the way the California lines were drawn and how it favored Democrats. The fact is Republicans have taken particularly states like Pennsylvania and Ohio and drawn districts that create a far larger number of Republican representatives than the voter, than the voting breakdown would have you think. That used to happen in California, sometimes for the Democrats' benefit, but we created a commission. We tried a new process. And uh, so now we're disadvantaged because the compensating redistricting by Democrats and gerrymandering doesn't occur, isn't occurring. So, uh, but it, it does have an impact. It, it puts a limitation on the ability of uh, Democrats to get back to majority because certain states, even where we have a strong support because of the way the districts are drawn, it's tough to win those seats. What, what we're talking about here is the swinging of the pendulum. Democrats are up, Republicans are down. Then over time, the Republicans are up and the Democrats. Are, what, what are the, the structural, institutional, public opinion characteristics that help us ensure that the pendulum swings back? Well, you, you said public opinion in the context of gerrymandering. I don't think the public thinks about how districts are drawn and the process by which they're drawn. So it, 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 a dedicated group of people qualified an initiative for the ballot and then the voters voted for it. But this was not something that came out of the outrage of the people. This was not a tax revolt or anything like that. Um, but the pendulums do swing back and forth. Uh, in 2006, the Iraq War, Katrina, George W. Bush, became so unpopular that even in areas where the redistricted have been designed to favor Republicans, a groundswell of support threw out the Republican Party from the House and the Democrats got control. In 2010, before this redistricting, it happened the reverse way when anger over health care or whatever it was at that particular time and a depressed turnout among the Democratic base led to a Republican sweep. One of your uh, main focuses in the Congress has been on U.S. foreign policy. You were chairman of uh, the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee. 
Uh, and uh, so what, what I want to ask you is where did that concern come from about foreign policy and get a sense of how you think the world is changing and how well the U.S. is responding. So, so is, was it your interest in Israel that drew you to that committee? Um, uh, part of it, but, but by no means all of it. I mean, as I indicated earlier, I, even from a, a great high school teacher, I started to confront major international questions. I don't know how one could be interested in what's going on in an American history and particularly recent history and not look at the World War II area and what led to that in the post-World War II area and the Cold War and then the dissolution of the Soviet Union and, and the disappearance of the Iron Curtain and, and then the globalization and the technology revolution and not understand and not think that what's going around in the rest of the world has huge impacts on us. And to me, it's, uh, it's pretty clear, and that's where my interest stems from. Israel's part of it, but by no means all of it. And, and how do you think uh, the, the world is changing, uh, making U.S. foreign policy harder to do? Or is that an assumption that you don't buy? Well, it is harder. Uh, mm -hmm. This is, uh, uh, I'll tell you one short story. Larry Eagleburger for a short time was the Secretary of State when Jim Baker went over to run Bush 41's re-election campaign. And at that time, the Iron Curtain had come down, Soviet Union, he said, a small group of us are having dinner with him, he says, we are going to rue the day, he said only half jokingly, that the Cold War ended because the stability and predictability of two superpowers, mutual shared destruction, lines they will not cross because of what could come, will break down and every ethnic and regional and national and religious conflict will come to the fore. And, uh, and then what we learned was the New World Order, the American uh, Pax Americana, is to, we can't manage that kind of involvement all over the world in the old way. Uh, and so uh, it is much harder to get our way in this. And, and governments are, have less power and people have more power. The internet, the communication system, the incredible levels of trade, uh, it isn't just touching base with a few authoritarian leaders to help shape a policy in a particular country. It's, uh, it's much more complicated now. And uh, it, it, do, you, do you feel that the Congress has the tools to learn how to address this new set of problems? Or do you think the Congress sometimes falls back on old ways of thinking? Well, I think sometimes they fall back on old ways of thinking. But just, you have to remember something about that process. It looks terrible. It, uh, you watch some of the things are said and some of the actions taken and you, your head spins. Are you awake? Are you watching what's going on in the world? But at the end of the day, usually, they come down on the right side, begrudgingly, maybe too long. Uh, but, uh, uh, and in foreign policy, the executive branch is still the uh, major player. And, and is with the, the House of Representatives, is, a, is, is there a problem with sometimes too narrow interests have too loud a voice uh, which uh, work against the public interest? Well, or does that work itself out? I tend to think it works itself out. I mean, there is a, there is a picture of, uh, of particularly House politics uh, of, of narrow parochial interests with views on foreign policy, many of them immigrant groups, many of them business groups, uh, works both ways, by the way, um, uh, having too great an impact on a particular member. But those things sort of level out and, and filter out. And this is a democracy. This, people are supposed to be able to make their case. And uh, so I don't, I don't uh, begrudge uh, 
people who feel very strongly that it's wrong for Cyprus to be divided, uh, lobbying their Congress about policies that will promote the reunification of Cyprus. That, to me, is part of the American process. One, one of your regrets as a congressman was uh, support for the Iraq uh, uh, war resolution. Looking back, I would like you to help us analyze, not necessarily your error, but, but the Congress's error uh, in, in being uh, too gung-ho in supporting the resolution. It wasn't a matter of being gung-ho. It was a matter of not being skeptical enough. I truly believe, not because of anything I heard from the Bush administration, but just from my own investigation, talking to people I respected, that Saddam had biological and chemical weapons, was working on getting nuclear weapons. He had had them in the past. Uh, the sanctions weren't working. He had stopped the inspectors from, he was acting like he had them and was working on them. And felt that this confrontation was going to come, probably better to keep him from getting those weapons, uh, probably better sooner than later. That was a fundamentally flawed judgment. Um, it turns out uh, he, didn't, he didn't have them. He had gotten rid of them. He was acting as if he had them in order to try and make Iran know that there was danger if they tried anything with him. Uh, and uh, I, I premised a decision on a false assumption, and uh, it was not good. It, it, was it also the, the, the terrorist attack uh, uh, that had occurred before that, that sort of created a mood about doing something, even though the evidence never was clear that there was a link with Iraq? Well, maybe for some people, but I never bought the notion. Anybody who followed closely did not think that Saddam Hussein, essentially a relatively secular individual, was working hand-in-hand -hand with al-Qaeda, a group of Sunni uh, fanatics, uh, to plot 9-11, to, uh, uh, to work together. Uh, um, I did not think Iraq was the target for a response to 9-11. I, I, was, I was more looking at what happened in the past. When Saddam invaded Kuwait, we took the appropriate level of action that pushed him out of there. Um, we did some, made some big mistakes. We encouraged the Shia to revolt, but then didn't help them, uh, left leaving a large majority of the Iraqi population very hostile to the United States uh, at a time when they might have looked at us otherwise, and, um, and, and thought that the people who were planning this could not make the series of mistakes every time there was a choice of going one way or another, how invariably they made the wrong choice in in prosecuting the war. Uh, so, but in the end, the vote was a, a misguided vote because it was based on an assumption that didn't exist. What Was there a fear? I, I just want to lay out all the possibilities. Was there a fear, I, I mean, even if the terrorist group wasn't linked, that terrorists would get a hold of nuclear weapons? And oh, sure. Yeah, oh, so sure. That was oh, no. The nonproliferation part of this mm -hmm. it was critical for me. Um, uh, the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty has not worked perfectly, but the one thing I believe, and I think it's still important in the context now of North Korea and Iran, the more countries that have a nuclear weapons capability it doesn't just incrementally increase the likelihood of a nuclear confrontation, it geometrically increases that likelihood. And uh, so um, there's no doubt about it. The uh, I'm of the school that says we should be working to reduce our reliance on nuclear weapons and standing very tough against anyone who seeks to acquire nuclear weapons. One of your concerns in the Congress has been American policy uh, toward Israel. And I, I want to get your analysis of how, if you think the U.S. relationship with uh, Israel is evolving and, and how it, it is evolving, if it is? Um, 
I go back to my thing earlier about how everybody, thinks, oh, it was so great in the old days and it's so tough now. I came to Congress in 1982, took office in January of 83. At that time, the Reagan administration was trying to sell AWACS planes to the Saudis against the fierce opposition of the pro-Israel community. The Reagan administration had imposed sanctions on what weapons Israel could get because of the Sharon invasion of Lebanon. Um, people at that time now were thinking about how wonderful the U.S.-Israel relationship was. They were very concerned about it. Ronald Reagan is known now as one of the great friends Israel ever had. So there are always crises in this. Right now, the U.S.-Israeli security co uh, cooperation and the programming on Iran has never been closer. U.S. policy, and I think the right policy, is two states for two people, and that's now the Netanyahu policy. Um, I want a Jewish homeland, and I want a democracy. And you can't control that entire area and have both. I, I'm curious, as you, in your role as an educator, where uh, in, in dealing with Israel, and you, you have constituents in the Jewish community, and uh, how one uh, uh, articulates the complexity, the, the complexity you just described uh, in the Reagan era, uh, you know, as a congressman, concerned about the, the, the concerns of his constituents, but on the other hand, understanding the complexity and the evolution, even if it's subtle and if it's a little piece of the, the bigger relationship, which remains solid. Hmm. Do you have to hold a lot of hands, <laughs> basically? Yeah, you, you, you got to work at it. You got to bring people with you. Um, but in an area where you've developed many, many years of credibility, yeah. I think you have the basis for doing this. And that's, that's a place to exercise some leadership. You know, I agree, I'm with you on this issue. You know I, we share the same vision. But let me suggest that this is a better approach than the one you've been pushing. And when you've had the credibility, I think you can make that case. And political leadership should require people to make that case. Do you, do you think that uh, the uh, U.S. should be very involved in the peace process, uh, holding all the parties' hands, uh, or not? Or do you think it should be just left to the participants, the Palestinians and the Israelis? Well, I have, give me a, give you two points of it. Number one, the fundamental premise that all our problems in the Middle East are as a result of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is nonsense. One has to just look at Syria or tensions throughout that region between Shia and Sunni, between different tribes, between borders drawn by colonial powers that have no relevance in terms of, uh, of what was really going on, to understand that some of these hatreds and rivalries and tensions have no relationship to this. On the other side of the coin, as somebody who cares about Israel, again, as a Jewish homeland and a democracy, I want the Arab-Israeli and particularly the Israeli-Palestinian conflict resolved. And I know that unless there's American leadership, the parties will tend to push back, and I don't want to see a third intifada, and I don't want to see uh, unilateral efforts by the Palestinians to create a boycott mentality on, on Israel. And so uh, I, want the, I want the United States to have a, uh, an energetic leadership role there. As a, as a congressman, did you see it your role at all to, uh, to work the Israelis, so to speak, to help them understand the subtlety in America's, you know, policy on a particular issue. I mean, in in other oh, words, yes. could, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you have a responsibility to talk to the people you really care about, if you think they're barking up the wrong tree, uh, and uh, and you do that uh, when you can, uh, especially if you have the credibility to make that case. And they also told 
were quite willing to tell me about it, areas they didn't think I was focused enough, enough on in terms of this issue and factors that I wasn't giving enough weight to. That's a healthy relationship. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not master-servant. Uh, it's, it's people sharing uh, 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 some values in, a, in an end game, comparing notes about how best to achieve it. Do, do you think that the, the Jewish communities thinking about Israel will have to change, not in their support for Israel, but in uh, understanding that not every Israeli policy is the co correct one if you're looking ahead to the future? I think the Jewish community understands that completely. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, look, the Israeli political system is tied up in, in knots now. But all I know is I've watched the transformation. When I got into Congress, you weren't supposed to talk to the PLO. There was never to be a, never a Palestinian state. Um, uh, there were certain things that were, over the time, look how things have changed. Uh, the head of Likud party supports two states for two people. This is totally contrary to the vision of the, the Zionist revisionists of the 20s and 30s about the land of it, greater Israel, the land of Israel from the Jordan to the Mediterranean. But people, based on the historic changes, uh, have changed their own views. And I think that goes on in the Jewish community. I think it goes on in the Israeli community. And, and so it, we're back to patience, really. Yes. And, and the, the respect for time and things change in, with time. Yeah, and, and things happen. That, that change history that you don't account for and sometimes slow this process down. Uh, uh, the Rabin government made some inc incredibly courageous decisions to move forward. Some Hamas bombings in Jerusalem affected an election and, and things went back a little bit. What about uh, the problem of Iran? Uh, has the uh, Obama administration's uh, Focus on sanctions worked. Oh, I, uh, it it hasn't achieved the end game, which is ensuring that Iran does not have a nuclear weapon capability. But it has certainly worked to change the Iranian reaction. Uh, the sanctions that have been put in place, and here I take some pride since it was my legislation. But uh, but the Obama administration has devoted incredible amount of diplomatic energy to building an international coalition. Unilateral sanctions by the United States are, don't mean much. It's only when you get others to join you. Take a look at Cuba. We've had sanctions on Cuba for how long? And Castro is the long, the Castro brothers are the longest leading, standing leaders in, in the whole world in terms of, uh, of sovereign power. Um, Obama has, has, has sold this to the international community very effectively. And in a way, I have to say that Bush, who was no friend of Iran's, never did, so that Iran is hurting, and that's why Iran is now talking about a diplomatic resolution of this issue. This was never their position before. It, uh, it, what's interesting is the, the subtlety of the Obama policy, which, which came in part from your, your legislation, uh, on the one hand, and when a policy is subtle, what, what's going on is not always apparent. And on the other hand, the opposition in the Congress to the sanction program uh, or the, the complaints about Obama's policy from some circles in the Congress. Uh, if you were still in the Congress, what would you be doing to navigate this to help educate your fellow congressmen? about the need for patience and the, what, what is working behind the scenes? Well, first of all, some of the education has to be on the administration because they do not communicate and meet with and sit down with enough of the House and Senate leadership that cares about this issue. And, uh, I mean, they got many things to do, but part of this problem comes from the absence of that communication. 
in the first couple of years of the administration, when I was chairman of the committee, I pushed myself into these conversations all the time. So we had a very clear understanding of when we move and what we move. Secondly, uh, there is a logic to a good cop, bad cop, if you pardon the expression, I say, Congress pushing creates a dynamic and sends a message to Iran uh, that's not such a bad message. Netanyahu blustering and talking tough creates concerns in the United States, but it sends a strong message both to Iran and to some of our allies that if we don't stay focused on stopping them from getting a nuclear weapon capability, there's a potential for a much bigger confrontation. So uh, there's a role in this dance that has some value. Do you think that Iran will ever stop building its program or uh, that, in fact, the sanctions will achieve that in? My fear is, well, Iran wants to have a nuclear weapons capability. I'm not saying they definitely want to build a nuclear weapon, but they want to be able to build a nuclear weapon in a very short period of time. They want to master every aspect of what that takes, including enrichment. Um, well, we cannot accept an agreement that gives them that capability because, because then there's too short a period of time to respond. So they're going to have to scale back. And I don't know how this is going to end. I think there's a chance we could get a meaningful agreement, but I'm very worried that our, our views about the right answer are so still so apart that we might not. Uh, uh, this is a story that will play out over the next few months, but I'm, I, I can't predict how it will come out. Do, do you think it's given the, the, the invasion of Iraq and our uh, involvement in the Middle East, which, which they look at from a very different perspective, do you think it's, it's, it's rational on their part to seek this capability, uh, a nuclear capability? Uh, and if so, how do you change that perspective on their part? You change that perspective. First of all, there is a certain rationality. If I have it, then I don't have to worry about anybody attacking me. We have to say, the pain you suffer from trying to get it will be so great that you ought to find other ways to work through these tensions in the region and with us. And um, in the end, we can talk about how fanatical they are or anything else. This regime wants to survive. And if their decision about nuclear weapons capability undermines their ability to survive, I think we have the leverage to back them off of that. Let's switch to a domestic issue now. Uh, you were very much involved in the uh, Stop uh, Online Piracy Act. And this is a case where there are real concerns uh, from, for example, from the entertainment industry about the uh, the abuse of copyright, the stealing of intellectual property on the one hand. But on the other hand, you have a new technology industry that is powerful enough to, to push back and say, if you uh, uh, make these regulations in, these, in this bill, that in other words, it will destroy the internet yeah, as we knew it. That, that was, can I just interject yes. here? Yeah, please. That is the biggest crock. <laughs> the notion that it, they know, they're smart people, they know it won't destroy the internet. Mm -hmm. In Europe, and in places where we want to stop child pornography, we block web websites disseminating uh, improper stuff from access all the time. The question is whether you have a rational basis for doing it. We do it for child pornography. We do it for money laundering. We do it for terrorism funds. It won't break the internet. The question is whether the scourge of digital piracy, the stealing of property, is a serious enough offense
to in utilize those kinds of remedies. I don't want to relitigate that. No one is pushing uh, the, the SOPA proposals uh, these days, but people should ask themselves a question, and that is, when you act, when your business model depends on your facilitation of piracy and stealing intellectual property, whether it's through advertising revenue or whether it's because your credit cards can be used and you can make the money that way or because more people, is that, is that a sound way to proceed to have a business model and, and do the pro laws on property rights that we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't trample on in any other sphere mean nothing in the digital sphere? I don't think so. What, what I'm interested in is, obviously the legislation failed to pass. Uh, w how does, uh, do the legislators move it to another level? I mean, if, if, if you were still in Congress, and th there are still problems out there that need to uh, be addressed, there was pushback. What, what, what is the legislative process uh, like in coming up with another solution that, that uh, takes account of the adversary's concerns, but educates the adversary about some of the arguments that you were just making. If I knew the answer that easily, we would have done it in time not to, okay. to pass this. But, um, but uh, look, for right now, I think different steps are going to be taken. Efforts to achieve voluntary agreements, convincing ad networks not to place ads on certain kinds of notorious rogue websites, uh, convincing banks and credit card companies not to allow the financing of transactions on those websites through your credit cards, um, uh, persuading uh, search engines and uh, others to do this, finding a way to monetize. There was a very legitimate rap on the industry in the early days. What are you doing to make your product available to people in places they want it, on their mobile phone, in their office, in their car, in a, um, you aren't moving it. But that's changed. As you can see now, there are a thousand different platforms people can get their content, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, they have, and, and people can't expect just to get it for free all the time. And, and so, so in a way, it, it's again this, this uh, piecemeal Pragmatic, incremental, pay, in, incremental, uh, yes. uh, in this that that and the, and the mistake may have been made. I'm not an expert on the legislation to to go for too big of a package. I take your point. Okay. <laughs> so so looking back uh, at your career, if students were to watch this interview. You you've been involved in a lot of hot button issues. You you've had a lot of uh, legislative achievements. You pioneered. Uh, uh, innovations in campaigning. What what lessons might students learn uh, from your career uh, that uh, would uh, prepare them for their future if they're interested in a similar career in politics? Well, number one, to be interested in a career in politics, I found, I can't. I consider myself one of the luckiest people around. And I got to spend 10 years in Sacramento and 30 years in Washington for a job, not as a hobby, but as a job, working on public policy issues, f f either feeling like I made a difference because of something I passed or fighting and defeating something I thought was bad. Uh, it was tremendously rewarding uh, and interesting. There were depressing moments, there are losses, but, uh, but it, just in terms of a sense of self-satisfaction and fulfillment in doing something meaningful, uh, I encourage people to do it. And, and, and if it's easier to get cynical, it's, but there is a basis for believing you can make change through involvement in the process, both working for and just as and more importantly, running for, uh, uh, elected office at federal, state, or local level, you can make a difference. And, and one theme that I hear in our conversation is you have to be uh, able to adapt to change, but in a pragmatic, non-ideological uh, uh, non way, showing patience 
and uh, a respect for inter incrementalism. Yeah, yeah. Without some ideology, without some view of the world, what are you going there for? Uh, just to be on television, uh, to get your name in the papers? If you let ideology and philosophy drive everything you do, you're doomed to a career of raising and losing battle after battle after battle. Well, on that uh, advice and in this uh, really fascinating account of your uh, uh, journey in politics, uh, Congressman uh, Berman, I want to thank you very much for sharing all this with us. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.